Welcome to Indiana University Cinema's virtual screening room. My name is John Vickers, founding director of IU Cinema, and thank you for being here for tonight's screening of Saving Brenton from 2017 and directors Andrew Sherborne and Tommy Haynes. Tonight's screening is presented in partnership with IU Libraries Moving Image Archive, which hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about tonight from our co-host, Rachel Stolci, who I'll introduce here in just a moment. After the film, Rachel and I will be back for a conversation for which you can all join. We hope that you and your loved ones are staying healthy and well. We miss seeing you in IU Cinema's lobby and look forward to that once again. IU Cinema vows to come back more stronger and more inspired than ever. Archives are dedicated to the preservation of and access to the world's cultural heritage. We have several great archives and collections here on IUB's campus, including the IU Library's Moving Image Archive, the Black Film Center Archive, the Lilly Library, the Kinsey Institute, the Archives of Traditional Music and University Archives, to name just a few. Film archives are committed to the rescue, collection, preservation, screening, and promotion of films, val films valued both as works of art and culture, but also historical documents. Tonight's film captures the spirit of a collector, an archivist, an educator, and a historian who has a love for objects, and more importantly, the stories behind them. The film screened on campus here in 2018 as part of a series of events put on by IU, IU's Arts and Humanities Council's First Thursdays. Filmmaker Andrew Sherborne and the subject of the film, Michael Zaz, were here in Bloomington to present the film, but also take part in other activities, which included a 16 millimeter projection workshop, as well as the short silent films that you're about to see in tonight's film, accompanied by a DJ spinning music. After our introduction, filmmaker Andrew Sherborne will also join you to welcome you to the screening. Rachel Stolci is the director of Indiana University Library's Moving Image Archive and an executive committee member of the International Federation of Film Archives, or FIAF, whose mission I stated uh, unknowingly uh, just a few moments ago. She also served as the chair of the Coordinating Council of Audiovisual Archives Associations, uh, Associations from 2018 to 2019, which is essentially the governing body for all film archives around the world. For two decades, Rachel has worked on preserving, archiving, and providing access to vast and varied film, photography, media, and individual personal collections. So please welcome our good friend and partner, Rachel Stolci. Good evening, and thank you so much, John, for that lovely introduction. Uh, it's such a delight to have you all here this evening for this special screening uh, that we're doing it virtually. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have the help the screening here um, at, at, in the Moving Image Archive screening room about a year and a half ago, as John mentioned, with one of the filmmakers and with Michael Zoss. Um, but it's great tonight to be able to share to an even wider audience here. And to that, I would like to send out a huge thanks to everyone at the IU Cinema for this screening and for their creative ongoing efforts to, to provide us with all fantastic programming while we're all at home and missing watching movies. Um, so tonight's screening of Saving Britain is particularly special to those of us in the film preservation and media archiving community and for fans of early cinema as it represents stories and threads that are core to our field. It has newly found historically important films, previously thought lost. It has a little bit of history of cinema and pre-cinema. It has behind the scenes look at film preservation. And lastly, it really showcases the passion that is involved in finding and preserving our cinematic heritage. As some of you may already know, roughly 85% of American silent film heritage is lost forever. Our film loss is due to two major contributing factors. Uh, one was that just the economic element of it. Um, once films were screened, they had no more financial value after their run. So they were sent around the country until the prints were screened everywhere. And as the studios could not make money off of them later, they were discarded or abandoned in locations uh, where they were shown. There was no secondary market for screening again or ways which we conveniently use now to watch films um, over and over again on network or Hulu or whatever. So additionally, the second biggest cause perhaps besides deterioration is that in the early years, films were made on the highly flammable film stock nitrocellulose or nitrate film stock, which is highly flammable, used also for making um, gunpowder and ammunitions. 
you might have heard of many famous um, nitrate fires in cinemas early on or later in archives. And these are, of course, also referenced even in contemporary films today as part of narratives in Cinema Paradiso or very creative use in Inglorious Bastards. Um, so as a result of that, to get rid of them and to get rid of this hazard, sometimes huge numbers of films were destroyed, sometimes buried in giant ice skating rinks, um, as in the story highlighted in independent filmmaker Bill Morrison's film, Dawson City, that screened here, or in swimming pools or elsewhere, or what has been referenced over time, that the studios dumped them off the coast of California into the ocean archive. Uh, we here at the Moving Image Archive here at Indiana University and our team uh, have been working to preserve the roughly 130,000 items in our collection. We too find unique titles and we work to preserve and make them available. We're fortunate that the library and the university has dedicated resources to building cold storage facilities. So cool and dry for those of you at home with collections. Uh, and with the support of the university and generous donors, we preserve the films that are here at IU as part of the century-long distribution and production unit of, and, and those films which we've brought in in the last 10 years to create the archive. And in fact, some of these films that we have in our collection came from unique locations as well. These are true stories, uh, one from a barn in northern Indiana, another from a garage of a retired projectionist near Louisville which contained a lot of nitrate, by the way. And of course, the coal core holdings that IU had, which I mentioned a moment ago, were for decades stored in a former bowling alley. However, we actively preserve and restore all the films now that are in our care. It takes a passion to preserve our history, and this is a gorgeous film that tells this tale. We are thrilled to be here tonight and to have all of you join us to see the film. And now I am very happy to be able to welcome one of the filmmakers, Mr. Andrew Sherburn, to introduce this treasure of a film that reveals a passion to preserve history with insights from private collectors, archivists, history enthusiasts, and more. Please join me in welcoming filmmaker Andrew Sherburn and enjoy the show. And please stick around afterwards for our Q&A. And thanks so much for coming. Hey, IU Cinema lovers. Uh, Andrew Sherburn, director of Saving Britain, here today. Uh, I'm standing in Film Scene, Iowa City's nonprofit cinema, uh, just a few blocks from the University of Iowa campus. And uh, I just wanted to, to say hello from one Midwestern college town to another, and, uh, and thank you. I'm so pleased that you all are gathering together from a safe distance, of course, uh, to watch this film. Uh, Saving Britain is an appreciation of community, uh, of our shared history, and of course, a love of film. And uh, in, this, in this challenging time, it seems more appropriate than ever. Uh, I hope it's a reminder of how film can unite us uh, from Iowa to Paris to Indiana and beyond. So uh, thank you for supporting Cinema in the Heartland and enjoy the film. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. And thank you, all of you in the audience, for being here for the introduction. Please come back if you can for the conversation and Q&A between Rachel Stolci and myself. At this time, you can access the link that we've provided for Saving Brenton at IU Cinema's website or on a slide that you'll see coming up after I'm done speaking. Uh, you cannot link, so you'll have to copy that URL into your uh, browser. On behalf of all of us here at IU Cinema, stay healthy, hopeful, and well, and try to help and support others where you can. Thank you for joining us. What a what a an inspiring film. I you know what I what I not not only do I love the story, I just I think it's an incredible lesson in civic engagement. And uh, Michael's such a humble, earnest, inquisitive man, and he was the same way when he was here. I, I did you get to meet him when he was here, Rachel? No, I was out of town. Yeah, boy. Um, I mean, just just like he comes across in the film. I mean, just what what a gentleman, and just what a curious and. Um, uh, thoughtful man and and so uh, it was a treat to have him here um i'll, I'll start off with a couple, a couple of questions but for the audience uh, there is a q a button at the bottom of your zoom webinar and if you want to start submitting questions we'll get to as many as we can uh rachel and i will just have a, a very quick conversation and then we'll open it up to questions and you know we, we talked about last week we were talking about the passion of of film exhibitors and and 
this film, you know, speaks to the passion of archivists. And you can see it in Serge Bromberg's face when he, you know, he discovers that, you know, this is a Lost Méliès film. And uh, just the pure joy of that discovery is, is pretty incredible. And so, you know, th again, the world is filled with passionate people like yourself. What do you think when you see a film like this? I mean, does it, how does it resonate with, with you? That's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, when we started talking about having a Q&A and even introducing it, I rewatched this film and I, I, the main thing I was taking away from it was passion, right? And, and I find this in our field a lot that we're all very enthusiastic and very excited. <laughs> yeah. um, and of course we love the art form, but I think that that's, that's the core component and what I was feeling. And, and of course the, the, the character, uh, um, Mr. Zoss is, is not a trained archivist, he's not professional, but gosh, is he full of enthusiasm for collecting and preserving our history. Yeah, and, and teaching it, right? And, and sharing those stories. And yeah. that's, that's what I find incredible is just his, his, his love for sharing and, and it comes across and everything he does, but then just the other, the other things that he, he does, you know, just for the good of it uh, was, was pretty incredible. Um, why did you, um, if you don't mind me asking, why did you become an archivist? Oh, um, well, I think it's a combination of love of cinema and, and my early history in uh, photography, sort of, uh, I feel like many of these things overlap, and of course, love of order. <laughs> But it is um, exciting, and I think I think those of us, when we do find something and we're able to preserve it and share it, that enthusiasm just sort of bubbles over. Um, so I think there does there is some joy that that we all get from from our work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, how often do discoveries like this, like finding a new Méliès or or the lost footage of Metropolis? I mean, how often do these types of things happen in the archival world? I feel like we read about them um, semi-frequently lately. Uh, I, I over and over again. It's and it's usually funny. It's somebody's found something at a flea market, or you know, they're not always lost because sometimes they actually are in archives, um, but they might be labeled unknown. Um, but people come across them enough that I think going to Bologna, as as they were able to do, and sort of see a new restored film and hearing the story, they're frequently of these funny little places where films have been lost for, for the last hundred years. Yeah, yeah, like um, you, you talked earlier about um, the Dawson City find or, or you know, throwing films in the ocean. It wasn't uncommon because there was no perceived value, uh, you know, of these, these prints at that time. Right, yeah, and one of our colleagues, um, this was an interesting story a couple of years ago in Iceland, um, a fisherman contacted the Icelandic Film Archive because he had scooped up a bunch of films. So they were actually able to save it and had sort of unwound it on the archive floor because it was of course all wet. So you go fish it and you find film. Yeah, incredible. Um, the, so there's there are lost films and then every archive likely has unique items that you know may or may not have been seen by the world in, in however many decades or, or years. Um, certainly the IU Library's Moving Image Archive has some unique films. Can you talk about that in your collection or? Yeah, um, we have we have a, a lot of films that I would say are unique um, that no one else holds. Uh, when we're talking specifically about the silent era, since that's been so much of the focus of the world with only about 11% of silent uh, features of American features still in existence. Um, within the David Bradley collection, which is part of the Lilly Library, we have four silent titles that apparently don't exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, both a study that was done by the Library of Congress and looking at the Biaf uh, silent film database. Um, there are Westerns from 1912 to um, 21, I think, or 1921 to 27 is what I think they are. Um, Wolf's Trail, which features a dog. Um, <laughs> the Blazing Trail, Country Kid, and Sky High Corral. So the ones that we have are sort of um, perhaps not of the sort of genre or variety that people will be as excited about. Because um, of course, not all film was fantastic as it isn't today, but um, but we do have some and we've just done 4K scans of them as part of our big media digitization and preservation initiative. So we will be restoring those and those can in fact be distributed. Okay, oh, that, because they're public domain. Yes, okay. yeah, right. So, um, well, maybe they need scores. Maybe they do. <laughs> um. For, for those listening uh, who 
don't know our program that well, we, we have a film scoring program where we commission students in the Jacobs School of Music to write music for silent films. And uh, anyway, we're gonna be premiering, uh, doing an encore presentation of one in later in May of a film that we uh, scored and presented in 2016, The Return of Draw Egan, another Western. Um, so can you talk about, um, I mean, you, you, I'm sure you know a lot of the players that were in this film, like Serge Bromberg, and you, you, you didn't happen to be in Bologna when this film premiered, did you? I was not. I've, I've been there twice, but not that year, no. Okay. And it, it's quite a spectacle. It's, it is the show place for new restorations like this, correct? Right. And, and especially right there on the piazza, they do it at night and um, all, the whole city comes out for it. So seen usually sometimes with live orchestra, um, but excited Italians and people who come and Serge Bromberg and, and lots of our, our colleagues. And that was one thing I think I mentioned early on I really liked about the film is we saw George Willimon, the nitrate archivist at Library of Congress. We saw the technician at Color Lab who does the work. And, uh, and seeing Serge Bromberg from Lobster Films um, yeah. to see sort of what's behind the scenes of actually getting a film once you discover it to a point of distribution and being shared is pretty exciting. Yeah. Can you talk about um, some of the collections that have come in? Uh, so you mentioned something in, in the introduction about um, how you receive some of the collections or acquire some of the collections. And sometimes people contact you, other times, you might hear of something and, and follow up. So can you talk a little bit about acquisition of, of collections? Yeah, we've been very fortunate, uh, as I've mentioned, and you'll see in our uh, the archive that's behind me, um, we have beautiful facilities that the university has supported at such an amazing level. And we actually have new film vaults that uh, we'll be moving the collections to that are 38 degrees coming up soon. Um, but as you've discovered, John, too, because you've brought us uh, two collections for sure that I can remember, if not more, uh, people will reach out to me or um, we see something on a listserv and we follow up with them and, and determine whether they fit our collection or that would be relevant for the cinema or our faculty. Um, they rarely come in looking anything like this. <laughs> um, as you know, since you brought some in, um, frequently disorganized, unlabeled, sometimes we can't even tell what they are. And even the IU collection for years was, was even in a sort of poorly arranged um, and poorly temperature controlled uh, facility. Well, let's, let's talk about that just for a moment for folks that don't know about the, the archive. And um, so as of 2010, and you had an image you could show people if you yeah. were interested, uh, but the, the film collection at IU was housed in, in a facility that wasn't climate controlled and, um, and even though there was a lot of good work done in the, on the archive with cataloging and you know all the other good things that archivists do, um, it, it didn't have the right conditions. So since 2010, the archive has transformed into something pretty incredible uh, with its own viewing facilities, work rooms, but then a screening room. Do you want to talk about any of that? And Sure, yeah. So um, prior to 2010, we actually were not even an archive. What, what we had on this campus, and, and I'll show you this beautiful room, uh, the former bowling alley housed what had been about a hundred years of IU's distribution and production films, so about 35,000 films. Also, the other units on campus were also stored here, the Kinsey Institute, Black Film Center Archive, University Archives, and Lilly Library. Uh, we spent a year moving these, uh, testing them for vinegar syndrome, identifying them, and recanning them when needed. Um, and yes, in the last 10 years, we now have a space with a viewing facility and amazing staff who are overseeing the um, film digitization on campus. That's what's actually beyond campus. It's all the IU campuses, 25,000 film reels in three years. And we've tripled the collections, um, which has been fantastic. And again, some of them, uh, like the Clio Advertising Awards collection is stupendous. Now that we're digitizing those and learning about them. Uh, we've brought in so many special, nice, unique little collections. I obviously could talk about this forever, but <laughs> I can wrap it now. Uh, well, it's, I mean, it, it's pretty incredible, the, the transformation and then um, to become a FIAF member. So, so Indiana University Film Art, Moving Image Archive, sorry, Libraries Moving Image Archive is one of the established FIAF members, a uh, full member, which Aren't there less than eight in the U.S. or maybe less than 10 in the U.S.? 
Yeah, I think of the members, I know members, and then there's sort of a junior membership affiliate category. Uh, there are 17 of us, but I, I think there are just a, a small number, and we're up there with the Library of Congress and UCLA and then yeah. George Eastman Museum. So, yeah, pretty. pretty yeah, cool. And that's because we have the standards we do, we have the gorgeous cinema we do, and we've really dedicated so many resources towards the preservation of these items. Yeah, and then outside of the library's moving image archive, there are then additional collections like the, the Lilly Library, which may or may not be within your collection, but, but that has unique holdings in outtakes and other things from filmmakers like Peter Bogdanovich and John Ford's home movies and some really incredible things. And then, of course, there's a lot of unique things in the Kinsey Institute as well. Um, so it's a pretty rich uh, campus of, of unique and, and rare holdings. Um, we do have a question for you from the audience. It's anonymous. And Rachel, so how do you feel about the preservation or lack of in film? Uh, does the Brinton room make you cringe uh, due to how it is not organized or the way the Brinton items were transported in an undercover, uncovered truck? Uh, or how is film protect, protected, uh, I'm sorry, or how the film is protected uh, in the barn outside? Is any preservation better than none? Fantastic questions. <laughs> um, I think the fact that a malaise film came out of that barn, um, and it's so good that it was in Iowa and not in Texas, <laughs> uh, that the heat and humidity somehow was protected. I think we're fortunate that, that those films were preserved for so long, and um, I try never to be very critical uh, of, of circumstances that are less than what we have here, which is really spectacular at this point. Um, I've, I've been in other parts of the world sometimes and, and they don't, they're less well resourced um, and people do what they can to preserve things. So um, I just think it's fantastic that, that Michael was so passionate and, and he, he did eventually find the right places um, to help him preserve it. So as far as walking into rooms like that, I, I do have my own personal instinct <laughs> to want to create order, of course. Um, but I think for those of us who've gone to, to locations where there are potential collections, frequently that is what they look like and not like our, um, I'll switch back to what, what we actually have today uh, for the archive. But it does take a lot of work and a lot of resources. Yeah. But yeah. no cringing. No. Usually I'm more excited than cringing. <laughs> Well, yeah, better in a barn in Iowa than the bottom of the ocean. Right. <laughs> or or well, I don't know, you, you wonder how well preserved the, the film turned out from the bottom of the ocean. But, yeah, yeah. Um, here's another question. Kelly asks, how do you feel about the colorization showcased in the film? I get the impression that the archivists and preservationists in, uh, in here are more comfortable with it's then uh, the outcry I heard from the recent World War II Peter Jackson documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old, uh, colorization attempts. Why are they diff Why is the reaction different? And that's a good question. So that is a great question, Kelly. Um, so there's a massive difference in what you just saw with the Malays films and any of those sort of um, 1895 on up films. Uh, those early films were, were hand colored, literally, each, each frame was colored. So every time you saw that sort of change, um, usually women, when you see, uh, or you read about this, women were sitting there with little teeny tiny paintbrushes and hand coloring it, right? So that's the original film and this is how it was made. So a restoration of that film would actually be sort of, it, it'll look the same. It's, it's colored, it's hand colored. Um, the distinction with colorization and um, Peter Jackson's um, film is about the fact that he went in and added color. So a restoration is you actually don't change anything. Um, and that's part of our FIAF code of ethics. So you're not going back and um, altering anything. And Peter Jackson added sound, added color, and sometimes erased trees and changed architecture. So um, that, that the distinction and usually the outcry is about the word restoration. So hand colored early films, adding color later. You know, there's, it, there is the scene where the um, technician is working at Color Lab and, you know, he makes the casual comment while well, I was just playing. And is there some of that? Um, you know, I, I know that they do their best they can to take it back to the original, but, you know, are there times when they take artistic license and 
Oh, of sure. course. Okay. Um, it is subjective, of course. Um, and we've done that with the, the, you mentioned the Peter Bogdanovich optics, which we restored, um, which were completely color faded to magenta because cyan and yellow go first. So there is some subjectivity, um, but there are also scientists, I think in Switzerland, who actually go back and figure out what the film stock was and figure out exactly what those colors are. But for the most part, most film labs are sort of um, gauging it, but they usually know what the film stock should have looked like. But yes, it's still subjective. I, I just had a question that I posed to Mike Machan and Tom Williman, George Williman. George. Mm -hmm about this return of Draw Egan because the restoration that premiered in Portanoni was tinted because it came from a print that was tinted at least partially, but then other parts were from a 16 print that wasn't. And so I, I questioned on the choices of some of the tinting for the scenes that came out of the 16. And you know how do archivists make those decisions? Um, and certainly they're informed um, because by other sequences or potentially notes, I'm not sure, but do you, know, do you know how to answer that question? Uh, lots of times people who are doing real restoration and also for audience members who don't know, tinting, tinting and tone films. So also early on, um, black and white films were uh, tinted. So they're actually dunked into dyes. So red would signify sort of scary, yellow is sort of happy sunshine, blue is usually night. Um, so frequently, real restorations, they go back to as much documentation as possible. That's why it's usually a collaborative around the world kind of um, uh, restoration project um, and finding that documentation. So usually they wouldn't just sort of decide to do it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm sure. Especially Mike and George. <laughs> yeah. um, here's a question from Peyton. Um, our hero, so to speak, of the film says pretty early on, I like to save things, especially, especially, especially if it looks uh, they like they are too far gone. Is there such a thing as too far gone? Indeed there is. <laughs> um, so motion picture film, like everything under the sun, uh, deteriorates and degrades, especially, especially, especially if stored poorly, hot, hot and heat and humidity are the worst things you can do. Uh, we have gotten films in and I've certainly seen um, examples, nitrate and, and uh, cellulose acetate both will deteriorate at different rates. Um, they'll frequently just, as, as the chemical deterioration happens, they'll break apart, right, and they'll start off-gassing the gas and turn into a puck. Um, it really gets to be like a solid hockey puck, and it's very sad. And, and sometimes you can actually rehumidify it. Um, so the difference between restoration, digitization, and conservation, we, we have um, fume hoods, not within the archive, but certain specialty labs where they'll sort of rehumidify um, films, and then you might be able to, to get through one scanner. Uh, but usually these become so brittle because they've lost half of their, the, the structure, the chemical structure has changed. So they're brittle and they become warped. They're very, you can't project them because the teeth marks, right, where, where the teeth of the projector goes, um, they've shrunken so much that the, the teeth of the projector would actually eat through it. So sadly, big giant yes on that. Yeah, there, there's a great example of, um saving something that seemed too far gone about eight years ago or 10 years ago when Serge Bromberg did Melies' trip to the moon. And that, that was, it, it seemed anyway, a hockey puck, right? Um, that they peeled off sometimes frame by frame. Um, I, I, I don't know if you know any more details on that story, but when I saw images of that, it just seemed like um, that would never be savable, but yet somehow they pulled it off. Um, yeah, no, it's costly and because, yeah, the emulsion will sometimes start to stick to the base and so it will peel off the image. So uh, we've, we've had a couple of projects in the last couple of years, home movies of someone on campus who uh, will hopefully be able to send uh, out to the public soon uh, that were exciting, but it took about five years for the process. So it's labor intensive if it has to be worth saving. Okay. And here's another question. Uh, speaking of deterioration, can you describe what vinegar syndrome is? Absolutely. Um, so cellulose acetate is the film. So, so nitrate was from the 1887 to the last nitrate was made around uh, 1951. Uh, as it became um, so flammable and uh, dangerous, cellulose acetate was created. And so uh, what happens when acetate deteriorates is acidic acid will start off gassing. So it's actually um, breaking away from the film. And again, this is sort of this puck-like structure that'll come. 
it smells like vinegar, uh, which is why it's called that. It's, it is not really very good for you. If you're around a lot of it, you'll start to feel sort of the causticness of it. Um, but it's, it's film deteriorating and, and those kind of collections, you can smell it. Nitrate smells a little different. Nitrate decomp is different, um, but it is all about uh, degradation. Yep. Can I, can I ask a question? And, and I know that um, booths that um, are archival don't like to run nitrate prints with a fear that is there, uh, are they contagious in any way? That what's that nitrate? Right. So no, no, no. I'm sorry. Vinegar, vinegar oh. prints. And so can can running a vinegar print and then running a, a print that's not uh, in that that's that type of degradation can can it affect a good print? Yes. Um, so it's an autocatalytic process, which means it'll like just prompt the the film next door to to start deteriorating as the um, so big giant yes. Okay. Um, so that's why we initially, when we moved out of the bowling alley, we we actually bought a, a giant freezer until, and we have started to digitize these, but you have to separate out what I always call the sick films from the healthy films because it is sort of like a contagious process, but it's autocatalytic. And, and with that, when you are putting them in through the scanner, um, then do you have to do a thorough cleaning or something of the scanner before you then run good film? That would be a great idea, yes. Okay. Change And ch changing gloves, too, because you want to wear gloves when you're handling them. Got it. Got it. Um, I don't see any other... Oh, there is another question. Um, Suzanne asks, my very favorite section of the film is the montage and of the old hand-colored films to music. Uh, do we have any hand-colored films in our archives? Uh, so we have copies of hand-colored films. We don't actually have any original films from sort of the turn of the century. Um, the collection, the David Bradley film collection has, um, it, it was sort of a comprehensive, it's, a, it's close to 4,000 titles, but a comprehensive sort of history of film um, from the very beginning on. So there's a whole reel of French film pioneers. There's a whole reel of sort of early Soviet films. So, but they are all, just to clarify that they are copies um, of, of, and not the originals. You do have some hand colored cameraless films. We do. Yeah, so we do, um, so experimental filmmakers sometimes paint on films or you can scratch the emulsion and do sort of fun things. Uh, one film that we recently restored and uh, showed at the cinema called Patterns was made by a filmmaker, Ed File. Um, and it's, there, there are a couple of them in the series um, and we had Jim Jarmusch's band um, come and play with them and that was a giant, giant success. And, the, and Color Lab did the um, 4K scan and new print out of, of that hand colored film because it's nitrate and we can't um, legally keep nitrate store on this campus at all. There's only four places in the country that do. Can, can I ask where you keep the, the films that are nitrate in the collection? Where do you store them? Oh, so we have an agreement with the Library of Congress and we give them because we, I mean, I, it's, I'd be breaking the law. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, I get it. I, I just, I didn't know where you, where you sent them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't. Yeah. We, uh, we hopefully we don't keep them for very long. It is a um, also shipping nitrate is a fairly giant uh, bureaucratic process of how you can legally do it. So getting them out is um, sometimes delayed. But we, we had a studio ship us a nitrate print by accident that they didn't know they had in their their vault and um, to screen. We couldn't screen it. And then it took us about six months to ship it back to get all the paperwork right and figure out how to do it. Um, so there's another question and, and we'll, we'll answer this one and maybe another if we have one. Uh, this is anonymous. Um, this is a story equally as much about the preserver as, the, uh, as what is being preserved. It is a, it, I'm sorry, is it common for preservationists to have credit in their work? Um, I generally think not. <laughs> um, I do love the story because it's so much about, it's a portrait of uh, Michael. It's also a portrait of Iowa, small town America. Um, uh, the, you know, there, there are times, I guess, within our own little, um, very small world of film preservation where we can go and present uh, a film that we've restored. Um, but for the most part, and I think that's what I started out by saying, I love when we can sort of uncover the invisible work, um, yeah. especially people who are this passionate. You know, the nice, it is nice to see uh, when there's a new restoration of a film, if it gets any kind of national release, that there is a restoration credit often. 
Um, and sometimes individuals will be named, often, you know, the, the institutions are named, but it is nice when they also name the, the individuals um, to give them their credit. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate that. And, and um, you know, it, it doesn't happen that often, but it's nice to see when it does. Yeah, people like George Willimon or um, Todd Weiner at UCLA Film Archive, like there's certain individuals who've spent, you know, the last 30 years just dedicated to this. So it's great when we can do that. Here's a question that I think will make our last question. Um, so what are some of the unique and innovative ways filmmakers are using physical film today? And is there an I ideal future you see for physical film preservation or otherwise? Wow, well there's, um, and I, bet, I bet John has some thoughts on this too. Creative uh -huh. and innovative ways. I mean, I could, I could talk more about the, the physical film and preservation and otherwise, but John, do you wanna pipe in and yeah, well, why don't, why don't you speak to, um, I mean, first, and then I'll, I will speak to it. Um, is film still the most stable way for long-term preservation? Right, so I think my biggest concern for current filmmakers today, even because if you think about some of the ways, if I could show you pictures of, of the ways the film collections come in to us or you see them, they're just messes, they're unorganized, but at least we have those out some terms, at least we have all these things. Um, I'm concerned about how people are going to preserve the digital files because we already have issues of digital preservation. And if you think about your files from 10 or 20 years ago on your computer, if you can even uh, um, open them, I worry about the, the digital side of it. So motion picture film actually if stored properly and our new vaults will show this will last, you know, for 500 years. So remarkably stable format if stored properly. Digital I'm super, super worried about. And from the filmmaking standpoint, I, I think, you know, more and more filmmakers when they can are, are still trying to embrace 35 millimeter or even 16 millimeter and um, still crediting the, um, the photography and the uh, abilities of the infinite color and the infinite depth and the infinite um, contrast to be, you know, far superior to the finite digital. And, and I, you know, I, I, still agree with that and I still think that a film shot on film presented on film in the in the proper setting is still unlike a digital presentation and and so I think you know there are still filmmakers embracing this uh, there are filmmakers that um, would not be making film if they had to shoot on film these days and so I just uh, finished um, editing a Abbas Kiristami interview uh, last week and um, he said that he would have not made films past uh, his film 10 if he had to continue shooting on 35 millimeter. It's just he loved the flexibility and the versatility of, of being able to, you know, shoot on video. And so anyway, I think it's artistic choice uh, by the filmmakers. And, and um, but as far as other unique ways that film is being used, um, still being used by experimental filmmakers, um, there are two renowned filmmakers, Nathaniel Dorsky and, and Jerome Heiler that still shoot on the same Bolexes that they shot on in the 60s and they would have it no other way. So I, I think, yeah, I, I think it's artistic choice, um, but I think filmmakers are still embracing film pretty heavily and Codex is still surviving because of it. Yeah, no, it's all great. And I also love that people can make films on their phones, but I don't know that those films are gonna be here in 10 years. Yeah. It, it, well, unless they put it out on film. <laughs> right, or lots of, uh, lots of reformatting and backing up. Yeah. Rachel, I mean, thanks for being here with us. Uh, for our audience out there, not only is Rachel the head of the, the archive, but she's been a great partner of IU Cinemas since the beginning. She's been on our program advisory board. She's been the chair of our program advisory board. So yeah, thanks for being such a great partner and, and doing what you do, what you do for the collections here on campus and being with us. And thanks to all of you for joining us and big thanks to IU Cinema staff behind the scenes making these events possible. Um, it looks easy, but there's, you know, there's a lot of work to produce these. So thank you all. Um, and we have a new film uh, starting to stream starting tomorrow called Pahokee, a great documentary that I think you should check out. And then next week we're showing student films, including some shot on film uh, in a, a program called Montage, which is a celebration of student work. So we hope you can join us next week. So thanks again for being here. Stay healthy, positive, and well, and we'll see you next time.